seems closer than before. Hare Krishna. Welcome to the welcome back to the live stream at Nila Madhava's gorgeous temple. And they're the stalwarts because it's raining like cats and dogs outside. You know, Houston, if you don't like the weather, just stick around for five minutes and then you, you, maybe you'll like it. And if you like it, stick around for five minutes and maybe you won't like it. So here we are. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Yesterday we heard the fourth chapter, a lot of the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, in which Krishna extolled the glories of transcendental knowledge and how transcendental knowledge can remove our doubts and allow us to live peacefully and more than that, to cross over the ocean of material ignorance and suffering. And now today, he's going to describe to us how to act. Hare Krishna. So we've got, we've got to do more than just think. we got to act. All right, Srila Prabhupada's uh, Mangala Charna prayers to the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Om Ajnana Timidandasya Ajnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Mayam Dadati Sabadantikam I was born in the darkest ignorance and I'm much of knowledge. I offer my removal Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya give me shelter under his lotus feet. Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master <coughs> and unto the feet of all Vaishnavas. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of Srila Rupa Goswami along with his elder brother Sanatana Goswami as well as Raghunath Asa and Raghunath Bhatta, Gopal Bhatta, and Srila Jiva Goswami. I offer my respectful obeisances to Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, along with Advaita Acharya, Gadadhar, Srivasa, and other associates. I offer my respectful obeisances to Srimati Radharani and Sri Krishna, along with their associates, Sri Lalita and Vishaka. He Krishna, Karuna Sindo, Dina Bando, Jagata, Gopika, Kanta, Radha, Kanta, Namostute. Oh, my dear Krishna, you are the friend of the distressed and the source of creation. You are the master of the cowherd men and the lover of the gopis, especially Shimati Radharani. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari. Vishabhanu Sute Divi Panamami Hari Priye. I offer my respects to Radharani, whose bodily complexion is like molten gold, and who is the queen of Vrindavan. You are the daughter of King Vishabhanu, and you are very dear to Lord Krishna. Banchakal Padru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyavacha Patitanam Pavani Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. They can fulfill the desires of everyone, just like desire trees, and they are full of compassion for the fallen souls. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunita Ananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda I offer my obeisances to Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunita Ananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasa and all others in the line of devotion. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, here we go. Deeper into chapter 5, or, or 
beginning of chapter 5 rather karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness Krishna consciousness is not just an armchair speculator's dream it means action we got to do something okay outwardly performing all actions but inwardly renouncing their fruits the wise man, purified by the fire of transcendental knowledge, attains peace. Whoops. What happened? Yeah. Mm. The wise man, purified by the fire of transcendental knowledge, attains peace, detachment, forbearance, spiritual vision, and bliss. Text 1. <clears throat> Arjuna uvacha sanyasam kamanam krishna punar yogam chasang sasi yachcheya itayore kam tanme bruhi sunishchitam. Arjuna said, O oh Krishna, first of all you ask me to renounce work, and then again you recommend work with devotion. Now you kindly tell me definitely. Which of the two is more beneficial? Purport. In this fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that work in devotional service is better than dry mental speculation. Devotional service is easier than the latter because, being transcendental in nature, it frees one from reaction. In the second chapter, preliminary knowledge of the soul and its entanglement in the material body were explained. How to get out of this material engagement by Buddha Yoga or devotional service was also explained therein. In the third chapter, it was explained that a person who is situated on the platform of knowledge no longer has any duties to perform. And in the fourth chapter, the Lord told Arjuna that all kinds of sacrificial work culminate in knowledge. However, at the end of the fourth chapter, the Lord advised Arjuna to wake up and fight, being situated in perfect knowledge. Therefore, by simultaneously stressing the importance of both work in devotion and inaction in knowledge, Krishna has perplexed Arjuna and confused his determination. Arjuna understands that renunciation in knowledge involves cessation of all kinds of work performed as sense activities. But if one performs work in devotional service, then how is work stopped? In other words, he thinks that sannyas or renunciation in knowledge should be altogether free from all kinds of activity because work and renunciation appear to him to be incompatible. He appears not to have understood that work in full knowledge is non-reactive and is therefore the same as inaction. He inquires, therefore, whether, one, whether he should cease work altogether or work with full knowledge. Text 2. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Sanyasak Kamayogascha Nishriyasya Kara Ubao by the way, just a pin point of information for everyone. We just reached 554 followers. Not everybody's viewing every day, but that's how many are, have actually kind of registered as followers. Pretty good. The personality of God had replied, the renunciation of work and work in devotion are both good for liberation. But of the two, work in devotional service is better than renunciation of work. Purport. Fruitive activities, seeking sense gratification, are cause for material bondage. As long as one is engaged in activities aimed at improving the standard of bodily comfort one is sure to transmigrate to different types of bodies, thereby continuing material bondage perpetually. 
Srimad Bhagavatam confirms this as follows. Nunam pramatak kurute vikarma yadindriya pritaya aprinoti nasadhu manye yata atmanoyam asan apiklesha da asadeyaha parabha vasthavad abhodha jato yavana jigyasa da atmatatvam yavad kriyas tavadidam manovai karmatmakam yena sharida bandaha evam manak karma basham prayunkte avidya yat man yupadiya mane pritir na yavan mai vasudeve namuchate deha yogena tavat People are mad after sense gratification and they do not know that this present body which is full of miseries is a result of one's fruitive activities in the past. Although this body is temporary it is always giving one trouble in many ways. Therefore to act for sense gratification is not good. One is considered to be a failure in life as long as he makes no inquiry about his real identity. As long as he does not know his real identity, he has to work for fruitive results for sense gratification. And as long as one is engrossed in the consciousness of sense gratification, one has to transmigrate from one body to another. Although the mind may be engrossed in fruitive activities and influenced by ignorance, one must develop a love for devotional service to Vasudeva. Only then can one have the opportunity to get out of the bondage of material existence. Therefore, jnana, or knowledge, that one is not this material body, but spirit soul, is not sufficient for liberation. One has to act in the status of spirit soul. Otherwise, there is no escape from material bondage as reminded by our train that goes by here. How many times a day? Many times a day. And what is it doing? It's carrying oil from one place to another. And why? Because people need it to move and to do things and to do their whole life is dependent on it now. And if that runs out, okay. Action in Krishna consciousness is not, however, action on the fruitive platform. Activities performed in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. Without Krishna consciousness, mere renunciation of fruitive activities does not actually purify the heart of a conditioned soul. As long as the heart is not purified, one has to work on the fruitive platform. But action in Krishna consciousness automatically helps one escape the result of fruitive action so that one need not descend to the material platform. Therefore, action in Krishna consciousness is always superior to renunciation, which always entails a risk of falling. Renunciation without Krishna consciousness is incomplete, as is confirmed by Srila Rupa Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Pra panchigataya budya harisambandi bastunaha mamukshubi prityago vairagyam palgukatyate. When persons eager to achieve liberation renounce things related to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, thinking them to be material, their renunciation is called incomplete. Renunciation is complete when it is in the knowledge that everything in, in existence belongs to the Lord and that no one should claim proprietorship over anything. One should understand that factually nothing belongs to anyone. Then where is the question of renunciation? One who knows that everything is Krishna's property is already situated in renunciation. Since everything belongs to Krishna, everything should be employed in the service of Krishna. This perfect form of action in Krishna consciousness 
is far better than any amount of artificial renunciation by a sannyasi of the Mayavadi school. Text 3. Geyak sanitta sannyasi yona dvishti nakankshiti nirdvandvo hi mahabaho sukham bandat pramuchyate One who neither hates nor desires the fruits of his activities is known to be always renounced. Such a person, free from all dualities, easily overcomes material bondage and is completely liberated, O mighty armed Arjuna. Purport One who is fully in Krishna consciousness is always a renouncer because he feels neither hatred nor desire for the results of his actions. Such a renouncer, dedicated to the transcendental loving service of the Lord, is fully qualified in knowledge because he, because he knows his constitutional position in his relationship with Krishna. He knows fully well that Krishna is the whole and that he is part and parcel of Krishna. Such knowledge is perfect because it is qualitatively and quantitatively correct. The concept of oneness with Krishna is incorrect because the part cannot be equal to the whole. Knowledge that one is in quality, one in quality, yet different in quantity, is correct transcendental knowledge, leading one to become full in himself, having nothing to aspire to or lament over. There is no duality in his mind because whatever he does, he does for Krishna. Being thus freed from the platform of dualities, he is liberated even in this material world. Text 4 Sankhya Yogao Britag Bala Prabhadanti Napanditaha Ekam Ap Yasti Taksam Yag Umbayor Bindate Palam Only the ignorant speak of devotional service, karma yoga as being different from the analytical study of the material world, Sankhya. Those who are actually learned say that he who applies himself well to one of these paths achieves the results of both. Purport The aim of the analytical study of the material world is to find the soul of existence. The soul of the material world is Vishnu, or the Supersoul. Devotional service to the Lord entails service to the Supersoul. One process is to find the root of the tree and the other is to water the root. The real student of Sankhya philosophy finds the root of the material world, Vishnu, and then, in perfect knowledge, engages himself in the service of the Lord. Therefore, in essence, there is no difference between the two because the aim of both is Vishnu. Those who do not know the ultimate end say that the purposes of Sankhya and Karma Yoga are not the same, but one who was learned knows the unifying, the unifying aim in these different processes. Text 5 Yat Sankhyai Prapyate Stanam Tadyogayat Abhigamyate Ekam Sankhyam Chayogam Cha Yak Pashati Sapashati One who knows that the position reached by means of analytical study can also be attained by devotional service and who therefore sees analytical study and devotional service to be on the same level sees things as they are. Purport The real purpose of philosophical research is to find the ultimate goal of life. Since the ultimate goal of life is self-realization, there is no difference between the conclusions reached by the two processes. By Sankhya philosophical research, one comes to the conclusion that a living entity is not a part and parcel of the material world, but of the Supreme Spirit Whole. Consequently, the spirit soul has nothing to do with the material world. His actions must be in some relation with the Supreme. When he acts in Krishna consciousness, 
he is actually in his constitutional position. In the first process, Sankhya, one has to become detached from matter. And in the devotional yoga process, one has to attach himself to the work of Krishna consciousness. Factually, both processes are the same, although superficially, one process appears to involve detachment and the other process appears to involve attachment. Detachment from matter and attachment from Krishna are one and the same. One who can see this sees things as they are. Text 6. Sanyasyastu mahaboho dukam aptu mayogataha yoga yukto munir brahma nachide nadi gachchati merely renouncing all activities yet not engaging in the devotional service of the Lord cannot make one happy. But a thoughtful person engaged in devotional service can achieve the Supreme without delay. Purport There are two classes of sannyasis or persons in the renounced order of life. The Mayavadi sannyasis are engaged in the study of Sankhya philosophy whereas the Vaishnava sannyasis are engaged in the study of Bhagavatam philosophy, which affords the proper commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. The Mayavadi sannyasis also study the Vedanta Sutras, but, but, but use their own commentary called Sharidaka Bhasha, written by Shankaracharya. The students of the Bhagavata school are engaged in the devotional service of the Lord according to Pancharatriki regulations, Pancharatriki regulations, and therefore the Vaishnava sannyasis have multiple engagements in the transcendental service of the Lord. The Vaishnava sannyasis have nothing to do with material activities, and yet, and yet they perform various activities in their devotional service to the Lord. But the Mayavadi sannyasis engaged in the studies of Sankhya and Vedanta and speculation cannot relish the transcendental service of the Lord. Because their studies become very tedious, they sometimes become tired of Brahman speculation, and thus they take shelter of the Bhagavatam without proper understanding. Consequently, their study of the Srimad Bhagavatam becomes troublesome. Dry speculations and impersonal interpretations by artificial means are all useless for the Mayavadi sannyasis. The Vaishnava sannyasis, who are engaged in devotional service, are happy in the discharge of their transcendental duties, and they have the guarantee of ultimate entrance into the kingdom of God. The Mayavadi sannyasis sometimes fall down from the path of self-realization and again enter into material activities of a philanthropic and altruistic nature which are nothing but material engagements. Therefore, the conclusion is that those who are engaged in Krishna conscious activities are better situated than the sannyasis engaged in simple speculation about what is Brahman and what is not Brahman, although they too come to Krishna consciousness after many births. Text 7 Yoga Yukto Vishudatma Vijitatma Jitendriya Sarvabhutatma Bhutatma Kurvan Api Nalipyate One who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, and who controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Though always working, such a man is never entangled. Purport. One who is on the path of liberation by Krishna consciousness is very dear to every living and being, and every living being is dear to him. This is due to his Krishna consciousness. Such a person cannot think of any living being as separate from Krishna, just as the leaves and branches of a tree are not separate from the tree. He knows very well that by pouring water on the root of the tree, the water will be distributed to all the leaves and branches, or by supplying food to the stomach, 
the energy is automatically distributed throughout the body. Because one who works in Krishna consciousness is servant to all, he is very dear to everyone. And because everyone is satisfied by his work, he is pure in consciousness. Because he is pure in consciousness, his mind is completely controlled. And because his mind is controlled, his senses are also controlled. Because his mind is always fixed on Krishna, there is no chance of his being deviated from Krishna. Nor is there a chance that he will engage his senses in matters other than service of the Lord. He does not like to hear anything except topics relating to Krishna. He does not like to eat anything which is not offered to Krishna. And he does not wish to go anywhere if Krishna is not involved. Therefore, his senses are controlled. A man of controlled senses cannot be offensive to anyone. One may ask, why then was Arjuna offensive in battle to others? Wasn't he in Krishna consciousness? Arjuna was only superficially offensive because, as has already been explained in the second chapter, all the assembled persons on the battlefield would continue to live individually as the soul cannot be slain. So, spiritually, no one was killed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Only their dresses were changed by the order of Krishna, who was personally present. Therefore, Arjuna, while fighting on the battle of Kurukshetra, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, was not really fighting at all. He was simply carrying out the orders of Krishna in full Krishna consciousness. Such a person is never entangled in the reactions of work. Text 8 and 9. Naivakin chitkado miti yukto manyeta tatpavit pashan shrinvan sprishan jigran ashnan gachchan swapanchasan pralapan vistrijan grinan unmishan nimishan api indriyan indriyarte shu vartanta ididariyan. A person in the divine consciousness although engaged in seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving about, sleeping, and breathing, always knows within himself that he actually does nothing at all. Because while speaking, evacuating, receiving, or opening or closing his eyes, he always knows that only the material senses are engaged with their objects and that he is aloof from them. Purport. A person in Krishna consciousness is pure in his existence and consequently he has nothing to do with any work which depends upon five immediate and remote causes the doer, the work, the situation, the endeavor and fortune. This is because he is engaged in the loving transcendental service of Krishna. Although he appears to be acting with his body and senses he is always conscious of his actual position, which is spiritual engagement. In material consciousness, the senses are engaged in sense gratification. But in Krishna consciousness, the senses are engaged in the satisfaction of Krishna senses. Therefore, the Krishna conscious person is always free, even though he appears to be engaged in, in affairs of the senses. Activities such as seeing and hearing are act actions of the senses meant for receiving, for receiving knowledge, whereas moving, speaking, evacuating, and so on are actions of the senses meant for work. A Krishna conscious person is never affected by the actions of the senses. He cannot perform any act except in the service of the Lord because he knows that he is the eternal servitor of the Lord. Text 10. Brahmanya daya karmani sangam tyaktva karoti yaha lipyate na sapapena padma patram ibambasa. One who performs his duty without attachment, surrendering the results under the Supreme Lord, is unaffected by sinful action as the lotus leaf is untouched 
by water. Purport. Here, Brahmani means in Krishna consciousness. The material world is a sum total manifestation of the three modes of material nature technically called pradana. The Vedic hymns, Sarvam Yetad Brahma Mandukya Upanishad 2, Tasmat Etad Brahmanama Rupam Anam Chajayate Mukundu Upanishad 119, and in the Bhagavad Gita 14.3, Mamayo Nir Mahad Brahma, indicate that everything in the material world is a manifestation of Brahman. And although the effects are differently manifested, they are non different from the cause. In the Ishupanishad, it is said that everything is related to the Supreme Brahman or Krishna, and thus everything belongs to Him only. One who knows perfectly well that everything belongs to Krishna, that He is the proprietor of everything, and that therefore everything is to be engaged in the service of the Lord, naturally has nothing to do with the results of his activities, whether virtuous or sinful. Even one's material body, being a gift of the Lord for carrying out a particular type of action, can be engaged in Krishna consciousness. It is then beyond contamination by sinful reactions, exactly as the lotus leaf, although remaining in the water, is not wet. The Lord also says in the Gita, Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya, resign all works unto me, Krishna. The conclusion is that a person without Krishna consciousness acts according to the concept of the material body and senses, but a person in Krishna consciousness acts according to the knowledge that the body is the property of Krishna and should therefore be engaged in the service of Krishna. Text 11. Kayana manasabhudya kevalaya indriyayarapi yogina karmakurvanti sangam chaktvat mashudaye. The yogis, abandoning attachment, act with body, mind, intelligence, and even the senses only for the purpose of purification. Purport. When one acts in Krishna consciousness for the satisfaction of, of the senses of Krishna, any action, whether by the, of the body, mind, intelligence, or even the senses, is purified of material contamination. There are no material reactions resulting from the activities of a Krishna conscious person. Therefore, purified activities, which are generally called sadachara, can be easily performed by acting in Krishna consciousness. Sri Rupa Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu describes this as follows: Iha yasya harer dasye karmana manasa gida nikilasapivasta su jivan mukta su uchite. A person acting in Krishna consciousness, or in other words, in the service of Krishna with his body, mind, intelligence, and words, is a liberated person even within the material world, although he may be engaged in many so-called material activities. He has no false ego, for he does not believe that he is this material body, or that he possesses the body. He knows that he is not the, this body, and that this body does not belong to him. He himself belongs to Krishna, and the body too belongs to Krishna. When he applies everything produced of the body, mind, intelligence, words, life, wealth, and so on, whatever he may have within, within his possession, to Krishna's service, he is at once dovetailed with Krishna. He is one with Krishna and is devoid of the false ego that leads one to believe that he is the body, and so on. This is the perfect stage of Krishna consciousness. Text 12. Yukta karma palam chaktva shantim apnoti naishtikim ayukta karma karena palestakto nibadyate. 
the steadily devoted soul attains unadulterated peace because he offers the results of all activities to me. Or as a person who is not in union with the divine, who is greedy for the fruits of his labor, becomes entangled. Purport. The difference between a person in Krishna consciousness and a person in bodily consciousness is that the former is attached to Krishna, whereas the latter is attached to the results of his activities. The person who is attached to Krishna and works for him only is certainly a liberated person, and he has no anxiety over the results of his work. In the Bhagavatam, the cause of anxiety over the result of an activity is explained as being one's functioning in the conception of duality, that is, without knowledge of the Absolute Truth. Krishna is the Absolute Truth, Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead. In Krishna consciousness there is no duality. All that exists is a product of Krishna's energy and Krishna is all good. Therefore, activities in Krishna consciousness are on the absolute plane. They are transcendental and have no material effect. One who is there, one who is therefore, one who, one who, one is, one is, one is therefore filled with peace in Krishna consciousness. But one who is entangled in profit calculation, for sense gratification, cannot have that peace. This is the secret of Krishna consciousness, realization that there is no existence besides Krishna is the platform of peace and fearlessness. Text 13. Sarvakarmani manasa sanyasyaste sukhambashi navidvare puredihi naivakurvandakaryan when the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally rena renounces all actions, he resides happily in the city of nine gates, the material body, neither working nor causing work to be done. Purport. The embodied soul lives in the city of nine gates. The activities of the body or the figurative city of the body are conducted automatically by its particular modes of nature. The soul, although subjecting himself to the conditions of the body, can be beyond those conditions if he so desires. Owing only to forgetfulness of his superior nature, he identifies with the material body and therefore suffers. By Krishna consciousness, he can revive his real position and thus come out of his embodiment. Therefore, when one takes to Krishna consciousness, one at once becomes completely aloof from bodily activities. Such a controlled life in which his deliberations are changed, he lives happily within the, the city of nine gates. The nine gates are mentioned as follows. Navadvare pore dehi hang so leilayate bahi Vashi sarvasya lokasya stavarasya chadasya cha. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is living within the body of a living entity, is the controller of all living entities all over the universe. The body consists of nine gates, two eyes, two nostrils, two ears, one mouth, one, the anus, and the genitals. The living entity in its conditioned stage identifies himself with the body. But when he identifies himself with the Lord within himself, he becomes just as free as the Lord, even while in the body. Therefore, a Krishna conscious person is free from both the outer and inner activities of the material body. Text 14. Nakartvitvam nakarmani Lokasya srijati brabhu nakarma palasam yogam sabhavastu pavartate. The embodied spirit 
master of the city of his body does not create activities, nor does he induce people to act, nor does he create the fruits of action. All this is enacted by the modes of material nature. Purport The living entity, as will be explained in the seventh chapter, is one of the energies or natures of the Supreme Lord, but is distinct from matter, which is another nature called inferior. Called what? Inferior. Called what? Inferior. Just testing. See if you're still awake. <coughs> of the Lord. Somehow, the superior nature, the living entity, has been in contact with material nature since time immemorial. The temporary body or material dwelling place which he obtains is the cause of varieties of activities and their resultant reactions. Living in such a conditional atmosphere, one suffers the results of the activities of the body by identifying himself in ignorance with the body. It is ignorance acquired from time immemorial that is the cause of bodily suffering and distress. As soon as the living entity becomes aloof from the activities of the body, he becomes free from the act reactions as well. As long as he is in the city of the body, he appears. As long as he is in the city of body, he appears to be the master of it. But actually, he is neither its proprietor nor controller of its actions and reactions. He is simply in the midst of the material ocean, struggling for existence. The waves of the ocean are tossing him, and he has no control over them. His best solution is to get out of the water of transcendent, by transcendental Krishna consciousness. That alone will save him from all turmoil. Text 15. Nadete kaschitit papam nachaiva sukritam bibuhu agyaninavritam gyanam tena muyan tijantavaha. Nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. Purport. The Sanskrit word bibu means the Supreme Lord who is full of unlimited knowledge, riches, strength, fame, beauty, and renunciation. He is always satisfied in himself, undisturbed by sinful or pious activities. He does not create a particular situation for any living entity. But the living entity, bewildered by ignorance, desires to be put into certain conditions of life, and thereby his chain of action and reaction begins. A living entity is by, by, is by superior nature full of knowledge. Nevertheless, he is prone to be influenced by ignorance due to his limited power. The Lord is omnipotent, but the living entity is not. The Lord is vibhu, or omniscient, but the living entity is Anu, atomic. Because he is a living soul, he has the capacity to desire by his free will. Such desire is fulfilled by the only, by the omnipotent Lord. And so, when the living entity is bewildered in his desires, the Lord allows him to fulfill those desires. But the Lord is never responsible for the actions and reactions of the particular situation which may be desired. Being in a bewildered condition, therefore, the embodied soul identifies himself with the circumstantial material body and becomes subjected to the temporary misery and happiness of life. The Lord is the constant companion of the living entity as Paramatma, or the super-soul, and therefore, he can understand the desires of the individual soul as one can smell the flavor of a flower by being near it. Desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The Lord fulfills his desire as he deserves. 
man proposes and God disposes. The individual is not, therefore, omnipotent in fulfilling his desires. The Lord, however, can fulfill all desires, and the Lord, being neutral to everyone, does not interfere with the desires of the minute, independent living entities. However, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and encourage, encourages one to desire in such a way that one can attain to him and be eternally happy. The Vedic hymns therefore declare, Esha u yeva sadhu karma karyati tam yam ebyo lokebya uninishate Esha u eva sadhu karma karyati yam ado ninishate the Lord engages the living entity in pious activities so that he may be in elevated. The Lord engages him in impious activities so that he may go to hell. Similarly, the Mahabharat Vanaparva states, Agyo jantur anisho yam atmanak sukaduka yoho ishwada perito gachchet swargam vash vashabramevacha the living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell as a cloud is driven by the air. Therefore, the embodied soul, by his immor immemorial desire to avoid Krishna consciousness, causes his own bewilderment. Consequently, although he is constitutionally eternal, blissful, and cognizant. Due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and is thus entrapped by nations. And under the spell of ignorance, the living entity claims that the Lord is responsible for his conditional existence. The Vedanta Sutras also confirm this. Vaishamya nai grinye na sapekshat vat Tatahi darshayati. The Lord neither hates nor likes anyone, although he appears to. <laughs> it's tricky that Krishna. Text 16. Jnanina tutad jnanam yesham nashidam atmanaha. Nitikashori is leaving. Hari Bol, Hari Krishna. We'll miss you. Jnanina tutad ajnanam yesham nashitam atmanaha tesham adityavad jnanam prakashayati tat param. When, however, one is enlightened with the knowledge by which nations is destroyed, then his knowledge reveals everything as the sun lights up everything in the daytime. Purport. Those who have forgotten Krishna must certainly be bewildered, but those who are in Krishna consciousness are not bewildered at all. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Jnana Plavena, Jnanagni Sarva Karmani and Nahi Jnanena Sadrisham. Knowledge is always highly esteemed. And what is that knowledge? Perfect knowledge is achieved when one surrenders unto Krishna, as is said in the seventh chapter, nineteenth verse. Bahunam Janmanam Ante Gyanamam Mam Prapadyate. After passing through many, many births, when one is perfect in knowledge, one when one perfect in knowledge surrenders unto Krishna, or when one attains Krishna consciousness, then everything is revealed to him as everything is revealed by the sun in the daytime. The living entity is bewildered in so many ways. For instance, when he unceremoniously thinks himself God, he actually falls into the last snare of nations. If a living entity is God, then how can he become bewildered by nations? Does God become bewildered by nations? 
If so, the nations or Satan is greater than God. Real knowledge can be obtained from a person who is in perfect Krishna consciousness. Therefore, one has to seek out a bona fide, such a bona fide spiritual master and under him learn what Krishna consciousness is. For Krishna consciousness will certainly drive away all nations as the sun drives away darkness. Even though a person may be in full knowledge that he is not this body but is transcendental to the body, he still may not be able to discriminate between the soul and the supersoul. However, he can know everything well if he cares to take shelter of the perfect bona fide Krishna conscious spiritual master. One can know God and one's relationship with God only when one actually meets a representative of God. A representative of God never claims that he is God, although he has paid all the respect ordinarily paid to God because he has knowledge of God. One has to learn the distinction between God <laughs> and the living entity. Lord Sri Krishna therefore stated in the second chapter that every living being is individual and that the Lord is also individual. They were all individuals in the past, they are individuals at present, and they will continue to be individuals in the future, even after liberation. At night, we see everything as one in the darkness, but in daytime, when the sun is up, we see everything in its real identity. Identity with individuality in spiritual life is real knowledge. Text 17. Tad buriyas tadatmanas tan nishtas tat parayanaha kachchan apunar avritim jnana nirdutta kalmashaha. When one's intelligence, mind, faith, and refuge are all fixed in the Supreme, then one becomes fully cleansed of misgivings through complete knowledge and thus proceeds straight on the path of liberation. Purport. <clears throat> the supreme transcendental truth <coughs> is Lord Krishna. The whole Bhagavad Gita centers around the declaration that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the version of all Vedic literature. Paratattva means the Supreme Reality, who is understood by the knowers of the Supreme as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Bhagavan, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the last word in the Absolute. There is nothing more than that. The Lord says, Matak Paratanam Nanyat Kinchidasti Dananjaya. Impersonal Brahman is also supported by Krishna. Brahmano hi Pratishtaham. Therefore, in all ways, Krishna is the supreme reality. One whose mind, intelligence, faith, and refuge are always in Krishna, or in other words, one who was fully in Krishna consciousness. One who is what? It's what? Okay, just checking to see if he's still alive. <laughs> One who is fully in Krishna consciousness is undoubtedly washed clean of all misgivings and is in perfect knowledge in everything concerning transcendence. A Krishna conscious person can thoroughly understand that there is duality, simultaneous identity, and individuality in Krishna and equipped with such transcendental knowledge, one can make steady progress on the path of liberation. Text 18 Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmane Gavi Hastani Shuni Chaiva Shapakecha Panditak Samadarshinaha The humble sages, by virtue of true knowledge, See with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog-eater, outcast, purport. 
A Krishna conscious person does not make any distinction between species or castes. The brahmana and the outcast may be different from the social point of view, or a dog, a cow, and an elephant may be different from the point of view of species. But these differences of body are meaningless from the viewpoint of a learned transcendentalist. This is due to their relationship to the Supreme, for the Supreme Lord, by his plenary portion as Paramatma, is present in everyone's heart. Such an understanding of the Supreme is real knowledge. As far as the bodies are concerned, in different castes or different species of life, the Lord is equally kind to everyone because he treats every living being as a friend, yet maintains himself as Paramatma, regardless of the circumstances of the living entities. The Lord as Paramatma is present both in the outcast and in the Brahmana, although the body of a Brahmana and that of an outcast are not the same. The bodies are material productions of different modes of material nature, but the soul and the supersoul within the body are of the same spiritual quality. The similarity in the quality of the soul and the supersoul, however, does not make them equal in quantity, for the individual soul is present only in that particular body, whereas the Paramatma is present in each and every body. A Christian conscious person has full knowledge of this, and therefore he is truly learned and has equal vision. The similar characteristics of the soul and supersoul are that they are both conscious, eternal, and blissful. But the difference is that the individual soul is conscious within the limited jurisdiction of the body, whereas the supersoul is conscious in all bodies. The supersoul is present in all bodies without distinction. Text 19. Ihaiva tarditak sargo yesham sam yestitam manaha nirdosham his brahmam sama samam brahma tasmat brahminite stitaha. Those whose minds are established in sameness and equanimity have already conquered the conditions of birth and death. They are flawless, like Brahman, and thus they are already situated in Brahman. Purport Equanimity of mind. Equanimity of what? Mind. Okay. Those who have actually attained to such a stage should be considered to have conquered material conditions specifically birth and death. As long as one identifies with this body, he is considered a conditioned soul. But as soon as he is elevated to the stage of equanimity, to realization of self, he is liberated from conditional life. In other words, he is no longer subject to take birth in the material world that can enter into the spiritual sky after his death. The Lord is flawless, because he is without attraction or hatred. Similarly, when a living entity is without attraction or hatred, he also becomes flawless and eligible to enter into the spiritual sky. Such persons are to be considered already liberated and their symptoms are described below. And they, where are they described? Below. That means it's coming up now. Text 20. Na parishyat param prapya, no dvijat prapya chapriyam, stira budhir asamudho, brahmavit brahmanistitaha. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant, nor laments upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self intelligent, who is unbewildered, and who knows the science of God is already situated in transcendence. So there you go, folks. It's as easy as that. Purport. The symptoms, I'll repeat that. It's such a nice verse. This is such a nice verse. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant, nor laments upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self-intelligent, who is unbewildered, and who knows the science of God 
is already situated in transcendence. Purport. The symptoms of the self-realized person are given herein. The first symptom is that he is not illusioned by the false identification of the body with his true self. He knows perfectly well that he is not this body, but is the fragmental portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is therefore not joyful in achieving something, nor, is, nor does he lament in losing anything which is related to his body. This steadiness of mind is called stirabudi, or self-intelligence. He is therefore never bewildered by mistaking the gross body for the soul, nor does he accept the body as permanent and disregard the existence of the soul. This knowledge elevates him to the station of knowing the complete science of the absolute truth, namely Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. He thus knows his constitutional position perfectly well without falsely trying to become one with the Supreme in all respects. This is called Brahman realization or self-realization. Such steady consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. Text 21. Bhayas parshesha shaktatma bindat yatmaniyat sukam sabrama yuga yuktatma sukam akshayam ashnute. Such a liberated person is not attracted to material sense pleasure, but is always in trance, enjoying the pleasure within. In this way, the self realized person enjoys unlimited happiness for he concentrates on the Supreme. Purport Sri Yamunacharya, great devotee in Krishna consciousness, said, Yad abhidi namamachat krishna padada vinde nava nava rasadam yudhatam nrantam asit tad abhidi bata nari sangame smaryamane bhavadi mukhikara shushtu nishtivanam cha since I have been engaged in the transcendental loving service of Krishna, realizing ever new pleasure in Him, whenever I think of sex pleasure, I spit at the thought, and my lips curl with distaste. A person in Brahma Yoga, or Krishna consciousness, is so absorbed in the loving service of the Lord that he loses his taste for material sense pleasure altogether. The highest pleasure in terms of matter is sex pleasure. The whole world is moving under its spell. And a materialist cannot work at all without this motivation. But a person engaged in Krishna consciousness can work with greater vigor without sex pleasure, which he avoids. That is the test in spiritual realization. Spiritual realization and sex pleasure go ill together. A, a Krishna-conscious person is not attracted to any kind of sense pleasure due to his being a liberated soul. Text 22. Yehi sang sparsha jaboga dukkha yonaya evate adyanta bhanta konteya nate shuramate buddha An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise man does not delight in them. Purport. Material ple sense pleasures are due to contact of the material senses, which are all temporary, because the body itself is temporary. A liberated soul is not interested in anything which is temporary, Knowing well the joys of transcendental pleasures, how can a liberated soul agree to enjoy false pleasure? In the Padma Purana it is said, Ramante yogino nante satyanande chidatmani iti rama pradena sao param brahma vidiyate. The mystics derive unlimited transcendental pleasures from the Absolute Truth, and therefore, the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, is also known as Rama. In the Srimad Bhagavatam also it is said, 
nayam deho deha bhajam miloke kashtan kaman arhate vidbhujam ye tapo divyam putraka jena satvam shudyat yasmat brahmasokyam tvanantam My dear sons, there is no reason to labor very hard for sense pleasure while in this human form of life. Such pleasures are avail available to the stool eaters, hogs. Rather, you should undergo penances in this life by which your existence will be purified and as a result, you will be able to enjoy unlimited transcendental bliss. Therefore, those who are true yogis or learned transcendentalists are not attracted by sense pleasures, which are the causes of continuous material existence. The more one is addicted to material pleasures, the more he is entrapped by material miseries. What goes around comes around, as they say. Text 23. Chaknoti haiva yaksudum prakshuri dami mokshana kama krodot babam begam sayukta satsuki naraha. Before giving up this present body, if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses and check the force of desire and anger, he is well situated and is happy in this world. Purport. If one wants to make steady progress on the path of self-realization, he must try to control the set forces of the material senses. There are the forces of talk, forces of anger, forces of mind, forces of the stomach, forces of the genitals, and forces of the tongue. One who is able to control the forces of all these different senses in the mind is called Goswami or Swami. Such Goswamis live strictly controlled lives and forego altogether the forces of the senses. Material desires, when unsatiated, generate anger, and thus the mind, eyes, and chest become agitated. Therefore, one must practice to control them before one gives up this material body. One who can do this is understood to be self-realized and thus happy in the state of self-realization. It is the duty of the transcendentalist to try strenuously to control desire and anger. Text 24 Yontak sukontudaramas tatantar jyotyadevayaha sayogi brahmanirvanam brahmabhuto degachchati One whose happiness is within One whose happiness is what? Within Within Okay, here we go. One whose happiness is within, who is active and rejoices within, and whose aim is inward, is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme, and ultimately he attains the Supreme. Confirmed. Purport, Un unless one is able to relish happiness from within, how can one retire from the external engagements meant for deriving superficial happiness? Confirmed, again, and again, and again, and again. A liberated person enjoys happiness by factual experience. I'll read that again, just in case you missed it. A liberated person enjoys happiness by factual experience. He can therefore sit silently at any place and enjoy the activities of life from within. Such a liberated person no longer desires external material happiness. This state is called Brahma Bhuta, attaining which one is assured of going back to Godhead, back to home. Labante Brahmanir Vanam Rishayak Chinna Kalmashaha Chinna Dvaida Yatatmana Sarva Bhuta Hiterataha 
those who are beyond the dualities of, those who are beyond the dualities that arise from doubts whose minds are engaged within who are always busy working for the welfare of all living beings and who are free from all sins achieve liberation in the Supreme. <coughs> Purport Only a person who is fully in Krishna consciousness can be said to be engaged in welfare work for all living entities. And normally it's for me or my family or my friends or my community or my state or my nation or whatever. When a person is actually in the knowledge that Krishna is the fountainhead of everything, then when he acts in that spirit, he acts for everyone. The sufferings of humanity are due to forgetfulness of Krishna as the supreme enjoyer, the supreme proprietor, and the supreme friend. Therefore, to act to revive this consciousness within the entire human society is the highest welfare work. This is the real way to be an activist. This is the real activist. One cannot be engaged in such first-class welfare work without being liberated in the Supreme. A Krishna conscious person has no doubt about the supremacy of Krishna. He has no doubt because he is completely freed from all sins. This is the state of divine love. It's the state of what? Divine there you go. A person engaged only in ministering to the physical welfare of human society cannot factually help anyone. Temporary relief of the external body and the mind is not satisfactory. The real cause of one's difficulties and the hard struggle for life may be found in one's forgetfulness of his relationship with the Supreme Lord. When a man is fully conscious of his relationship with Krishna, he is actually a liberated soul, although he may be in the material tabernacle. 26. Kama Kroda Vimuktana Yatinam Yatichetasam Abito Brahmanir Banam Vartate Viditatmanam Those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self realized, self disciplined, and constantly endeavoring for perfection, are assured of liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. Purport of the saintly persons who are constantly engaged in striving towards salvation, one who is in Krishna consciousness is the best of all. The Bhagavatam confirms this fact as follows. Yad pada panka chapala chabilasa bhaktya karma shayan gratititam ugahanti santaha tad vanna dikta mata yor yata yor pimruta just try to worship in devotional service, Vasudeva, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even great sages are not, not able to control the forces of the senses as effectively as those who are engaged in transcendental bliss by serving the lotus feet of the Lord, uprooting the deep grown desire for, sen for fruitive activities. In the, in the conditioned soul, the desire to enjoy the fruity results of work is so deep-rooted that it is very difficult, even for the great sages, to control such desires, despite great endeavors. A devotee of the Lord, constantly engaged in devotional service and Krishna consciousness, perfect in self-realization, very quickly attains liberation in the Supreme. Owing to his complete knowledge and self-realization, he always remains in trance. To cite an analogous example of this, Darshana Dhyana Sangspar Shire Matya Korma Bihan Gamaha Swanyapatyani Pushnanti Tataham Abhipadmaja By vision, by meditation, and by touch only do a fish, the tortoise, and the birds maintain their offspring. Similarly, do I also, O Padmaja? 
The fish brings up its offspring simply by looking at them. The tortoise brings up its offspring simply by meditation. The eggs of the tortoise are laid on land, and the tortoise meditates on the eggs while in the water. Similarly, the devotee in Krishna consciousness, although far away from the Lord's abode, can elevate himself to that abode simply by thinking of him constantly, by engagement in Krishna consciousness. He does not feel the pangs of material miseries. This state of life is called Brahma Nirvana, or the absence of material miseries, due to being constantly immersed in the Supreme. Text 27, 28. Sparshan Kritva Bahir Bayangs Chakshus Chaivan Tade Bruboho Pranapanao Samao Kritva Nasabhyantada Charinao Jatendriya Mano Budir Munir Moksha Parayanaha Vigatecha Bayakrodo Yaksada Mukta Evasaha Shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the nostrils, and thus controlling the mind, senses, and intelligence, the transcendentalist, aiming at liberation, becomes free from desire, fear, and anger. One who was always in this state is certainly liberated. Purport. Being engaged in Krishna consciousness, one can immediately understand one's spiritual identity, and then one can understand the Supreme Lord by means of devotional service. When one is well situated in devotional service, one comes to the transcendental position, qualified to feel the presence of the Lord in the sphere of one's activity. This particular position is called liberation in the Supreme. <clears throat> After explaining the, uh, the above principles of liberation, <clears throat> After explaining the above principles of liberation in the Supreme, the Lord gives instruction to Arjuna as to how one can come to that position by the practice of the mysticism of yoga known as Ashtanga Yoga, which is divisible into eightfold procedure called Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. In the sixth chapter, the subject of yoga is explicitly detailed, and at the end of the fifth, it is only preliminarily explained. One has to drive out the sense objects, such as sound, touch, form, taste, and smell, by the Pratyahara process in yoga, and then keep the vision of the eyes between the two eyebrows, and concentrate on the tip of the nose with half-closed lids. There's no benefit of closing the eyes altogether because then there's every chance of falling asleep. Nor is there benefit in opening the eyes completely because then <laughs> there is a hazard of being attracted by sense objects. The breathing movement is restrained within the nostrils by neutralizing the up-moving and down-moving air within the body. By practice of such yoga, one is able to gain control over the senses refrain from outward sense objects, thus prepare oneself for liberation in the Supreme. This yoga process helps one become free from all kinds of fear and anger and thus feel the presence of the Supersoul in the transcendental situation. In other words, Krishna consciousness is the easiest process of executing yoga principles. This will be thoroughly explained in the next chapter. A Christian conscious person, however, being always engaged in devotional service, does not risk losing his senses to some other engagement. This is the better way of controlling the senses than by the Ashtanga Yoga. 29. Bhuktaram Jagatapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarvabhutanam Gyatvamam Shantim Richtiti. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all the plan all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well wisher of all living entities, attains peace 
from the pangs of material miseries. Purport. The conditioned souls within the clutches of the illusory energy are, are all anxious to attain peace in the material world. But they do not know the formula for peace, which is explained in this part of the Bhagavad Gita. The greatest peace formula is simply this. Lord Krishna is the beneficiary in all human activities. Men should offer everything to the transcendental service of the Lord because he is the proprietor of all planets and the demigods thereon. No one is greater than he. He is greater than the greatest of the demigods, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. In the Vedas, the Supreme Lord is described as Tam Ishwananam Paramam Maheshwaram. Under the spell of illusion, living entities are trying to be lords of all they survey, but actually they are dominated by the material energy of a lord. The lord is the master of material nature, and the conditioned souls are under the stringent rules of material nature. Unless one understands these bare facts, it is not possible to achieve peace in the world, either individually or collectively. This is the sense of Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna is the supreme predominator, and all living entities, including the great demigods, are his subordinates. One can attain perfect peace only in complete Krishna consciousness. This fifth chapter is the practical explanation of Krishna consciousness, generally known as Karma Yoga. The question of mental speculation as to how Karma Yoga can give liberation is answered herewith. To work in Krishna consciousness is to work with the complete knowledge of the Lord as the predominator. Such work is not different from transcendental knowledge. Direct Krishna consciousness is Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga is a path leading to Bhakti Yoga. Krishna consciousness means to work in full knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute and the perfection of this consciousness is full knowledge of Krishna or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A pure soul is the eternal servant of God as his fragmental part and parcel. He comes into contact with Maya illusion due to the desire to lord it over Maya and that is the cause of his many sufferings. As long as he is in contact with matter, he has to execute work in terms of material necessities. Krishna consciousness, however, brings one into spiritual life even while one is, in with, with, is within the jurisdiction of matter, for it is an arousing of spiritual existence by practice in the material world. The more one is advanced, the more he is, the more he is freed from the clutches of matter. The Lord is not partial toward anyone. Everything depends on one's practical performance of duties in Krishna consciousness, which in every respect helps one control the senses and conquer the influence of desire and anger. And one who stands fast in Krishna consciousness, controlling the above-mentioned passions, remains factually in the transcendental stage, or Brahma Nirvana. The Eightfold Yoga Mysticism is automatically practiced in Krishna consciousness because the ultimate purpose is served. There is a gradual process of elevation in the practice of yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. But these only preface perfection by devotional service, which alone can award peace to the human being. It is the highest perfection of life. Thus then the Bhaktivedanta purports to the fifth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of karma yoga or action in Krishna consciousness. Srimad Prabhupada ki ja, Sri Krishna ki ja, Gaur Premanandi. So I purposely read the whole chapter because I wanted to get a continuity of that chapter. It's a very important chapter. So anybody have any Reflections, comments. Just a quick, uh, I, mean, I don't know if I got the grammar right on this. One who performs his duty without attachment, surrendering his hopes unto the Supreme Lord, 
is unaffected by sinful action as the lotus feet is untouched by water. His sinful action or sinful action geared towards him? The, wa the, lo the lotus is in the water, okay. but it's on a stem and it sits above the water. So it's in the water, but it doesn't get wet. Okay. So a person who's in Krishna consciousness, who's doing whatever he's doing consciously, conscious that Krishna is the proprietor, Krishna is the enjoyer, and Krishna is the friend. And he does his duties no matter where he is, no matter what he does in that consciousness, then he doesn't, he, he's like that lotus leaf, he's in the muck, but he doesn't get, it doesn't get on him. Okay. The, the reactions don't, don't take effect. Okay. He's not making sinful actions, that it's sinful actions in the world that he's unaffected. Yeah, he, but yeah. it's not that he sins exactly. I mean, in one sense, in one sense, anything that you do that is not directly for the pleasure of Krishna is sinful. Okay. But if you're working, even though you're working in an environment that's not clean, that's not pure, that's not, that's, you know, you have to contact people and things and right. things that are not clean, if you're doing it in Krishna consciousness, then those that effect doesn't stick on you. That's that's the best way of putting it. Okay. It's like a wall that's so clean, you put some, it goes boom, and it just goes whew. It doesn't stick. The politicians are always throwing mud and hoping that something will stick. They don't care whether it's true or not. They just keep throwing the mud, you know, and something sticks, okay, then somebody will vote for me. You know, it's like... Okay. So when we're doing work in the world, no matter what we're doing, you know, if we're, if we're in that consciousness, and, and naturally when you're in that consciousness, you'll want to give the results of your work to Krishna. And if you, if, you do, if you give everything, if you give all the results of what you're doing to Krishna, then you're a sannyasi. Whether you're a woman or a man or a grahasta or a whatever you are, street sweeper, <laughs> anything, you're a sannyasi. That's the, and the first verse of the next chapter will explain that very clearly. Krishna will explain it. Anashrita karma phalam karyam karma karotiya sa sanyasi cha yogi cha nani ragni na chakriya we'll, we'll come to that tomorrow. <laughs> so when Arjun... Wait, Sarva, Sarva's going to say something. Okay, Sarva. When Arjun... When he didn't want to fight, he was, more involved with karma. he was more involved with karma. Yeah, he would have been if he didn't. I mean, if he. Exactly. Exactly. If he would have, if he would have gone away from the battle, then he would have created karma. But if he did what Krishna wanted him to do, even though it was battle, even though it was seemingly a violent activity, because it's what Krishna wanted. Of course, we can't do something violent and then think it's okay because Christ, because Arjuna did something violent. You know, Krishna was actually there right at his side saying, do this. You know, and if people don't, if you, if you do something violent and think that it's okay because it's in the Bhagavad Gita, then, that, then you'll get heavy reactions. Especially if you use Krishna's philosophy to do something nonsense. You know, and Krishna has it really told you. You hear about it every day in the papers nowadays. God told me to throw my daughter out of the window. <laughs> no, seriously. I heard it just the other day. It was in a headline. This woman threw his, her daughter out the window and said, God told me to do it. <laughs> That's how degraded the, the world's become. And it's happening a lot, not just once. Or, it's happening a lot all over the world. That's why this is a very safe place. Right at the feet of Krishna, hearing the Bhagavad Gita with the devotees is the first step and in the last step. It's the first step and the last step, both. It's the means to achieve the end and it's the end. Because we hear and chant like this, it makes us so happy and when we get to the spiritual world, we will continue to hear and chant. Only it will be more intimate glories of Krishna and like that.
And when you get that feeling, the only thing left to do is to share it with others. That's it. And then that feeling will just explode and you'll be in such happiness you won't be able to imagine it, at least at this point. What else? Is there anything from, from out there in cyberspace? Okay. Just commenting on how lovely your garland is. <laughs> <laughs> and how wonderful it is to watch these lectures. Hare Krishna. Well, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Shri Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo. Samabeda Bhaktivinda Ki Jai. <laughs>